The dream of being a professional classical musician is generally one born of passion and a love for the art form. It's a famously demanding industry, where it's not unusual to hear stories of people practicing hours a day for literal decades, starting from childhood to perfect their craft. And while there are other jobs a classical musician can pursue to earn a living from their music and ability, being a full-time symphony musician for a well-paying orchestra is the dream, the ultimate goal for a huge portion of music school and conservatory students. However, the statistical probability of a musician succeeding and obtaining a career as a symphony orchestra musician is shockingly low. I mean really, really low, even for those people who attended the absolute best schools. And when we look at these statistics coupled with the ever-increasing price of higher education, attending a major U.S. conservatory with this goal in mind begins to feel at best like a high-risk gamble and at worst like an outright scam. So let's start with the basics. The average tuition per year to attend one of these prestigious U.S. conservatories for an undergraduate education is $51,859. The average four-year cost for seven of these nine schools, the ones that provided data, is $271,260. This figure, of course, includes tuition, room and board, books, and the various other fees you will be subject to while at school. And with the exception of the Cleveland Institute of Music that did a tuition reset back in 2018, lowering tuition from $47,200 to $40,000 a year, and then holding it there, tuition prices on the whole have been steadily increasing. Using the Juilliard School as an example, in the last 10 years between the 2011 and the 2020 academic calendar years, Juilliard's tuition rose from $33,630 a year to $49,260 a year. In the current 2021 and 2022 academic calendar year, it continued rising up to $51,230. From 2011 to 2021 represents a 52.3% increase in tuition and has been far outpacing inflation for the same time period. And while the cost of school has continued to outpace inflation, in the orchestral world, many salaries have not. A prime example of this is the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. While the years I found for this data do not line up exactly with our Juilliard sample, they are fairly close. The base pay for the Baltimore Symphony during the 2008 and 2009 season was $78,500. And if we fast forward to the 2019-2020 season, if it had been able to occur, the base pay would have been $84,696. That is only a 7.9% base pay increase in 12 seasons. And while this is only one example, one does not have to look far to see other instances of the industry's general decline. But let's not go too far down that rabbit hole just yet. I want to get a clearer picture of the financial reality that is taking out one of these large loans to attend one of the aforementioned schools. So let's take that average four-year cost from earlier, $271,260, and plug it into a loan calculator that is set to the average combined federal and private student loan rate of 5.8%. Following the recommended 10-year repayment plan suggested for most student loans, if you were to take out that $271,260, you would have a $2,984 payment per month if you wanted to pay off that loan in the standard 10-year time frame. That is $35,808 a year. At this point, most of you are probably wondering, is that something the average classical musician can really afford? And the good news is, we can find out. Using the Federal Student Aid Loan Simulator, College Scorecard provides the median starting salaries for a student graduating from any school's individual program. While it's not a perfect tool, in this case it should be somewhat helpful in determining how much money someone should be taking out in loans to pay for a degree. To set a baseline, if we go to Johns Hopkins University and pursue an undergraduate degree in economics, we can see that the median starting salary is $75,047. Now, if we look at the median starting salary for a graduate of the Peabody Institute of the Johns Hopkins University in a music degree, the starting salary is not found. Well, let's try some other schools. The New England Conservatory, perhaps. Here we can see the starting salary is $11,851. How much was tuition per year again? $52,730? That's nearly five times the median reported starting salary. That's not exactly a great return on investment. But how do other schools fare? Not much better. And like Peabody, some schools don't have data. But unlike Peabody, it 
ends up defaulting to a school-wide average. These salaries are generally higher, but they are still not great. Now, I'm not really sure how fair this data is, since so many music students go straight into graduate school following graduation from their undergraduate degrees. So what are the median salaries for some of these schools' master's programs? And we can see that the extra two years definitely has a positive increase on the median salary, but these numbers are still lacking. They certainly won't cover that yearly $35,808 loan payment that we have from our undergraduate degree. Not to mention the additional debt that attending grad school will almost certainly add to our overall loan total. So with these median salaries, we can see that even if every penny you made the entire year went to paying off your student loan debt, it still would not be enough to keep you on track to pay off your debt in the recommended time frame. And to be fair, $271,260 is a crushing amount of debt that the vast majority of people would struggle to ever repay regardless of the industry they were a part of, let alone the classical music industry. So it's fortunate that the vast majority of people who get accepted into one of these schools will receive some amount of financial aid. And if we acknowledge that the majority of people who get accepted into one of these schools won't be bearing the full brunt of the cost, and will maybe only pay half, a third, or even a quarter of the total cost of their education, does it then become worth it for them to continue their dream of becoming a professional classical musician? Well, the data shows us that even paying off a quarter of the average cost of school, $67,815, in that standard 10-year time frame, won't be feasible for the majority of people trying to make a living in this industry. And part of that is due to the overwhelmingly low probability of winning an orchestral job that will provide a salary that can pay for that loan. But we will get back to that in a minute, because before this video is labeled a case of sour grapes, or I am generally mischaracterized as a bitter conservatory graduate, I would just like to say up front that I am someone who absolutely loved their time in music school. I spent two years at the Peabody Institute for graduate school. I literally could not imagine a better musical instruction than what I received. And speaking for myself, if becoming a better musician was the only goal, the only reason one might want to attend a music conservatory, I would have no complaints. It 110% accomplished that goal. However, for most people, myself included, that's not really the main goal. The main goal is to gain the skills necessary to make it as a career musician. For most people studying an orchestral instrument at a major conservatory, that means they are asking themselves when they finish their degree, am I now good enough to win an orchestral audition? And this is where the problems really start. Because as it turns out, and speaking as a clarinetist, not only is it very difficult to win any audition, no matter the orchestra's size, the amount of orchestras that pay enough to put musicians in the middle income tier of earners in the United States, meaning orchestras that pay around $50,000 or more, are not numerous. Now, I want to quickly note that orchestral audition opportunities are going to vary quite widely based on the instrument someone plays. Violinists, for instance, are going to have a lot more opportunities than tubists. While the specific data will be different for each instrument, I think the following statistics centered around clarinet auditions will be interesting for anyone considering pursuing a career as an orchestral musician, no matter the instrument they play. Which brings us to the data. For the last few weeks, I have trawled through the internet looking for the contracts of as many orchestras that fit into that aforementioned middle income tier. Contracts have changed widely over the last few years due to COVID, and while a Google search can often provide references to minimum contract salaries, the data I had at my disposal may not have always been accurate. Therefore, some of these orchestras may no longer deserve to be on this list, and there are probably a few orchestras out there that I overlooked and should have been included. That being said, I'm fairly confident that this is the majority of orchestras that fit my criteria. In total, I have 37 orchestras listed. In these 37 orchestras, I've listed 108 clarinetists. As far as I know, these musicians have won jobs with their respective orchestras, and I did not include musicians listed as subs, long-term, or otherwise. I went through every single one of these clarinetist profiles on each orchestra's website to see which schools they have listed as having attended in their biographies. With all of this data, we can get an idea of how many people really make it as clarinetists in the orchestral world and which schools are most represented by alumni. Here is the breakdown of every school in the US that has more than one alumni in the list of 108 clarinetists. 
If you would like to see the full list and all the institutions represented, I will be posting it on the Clarinet B board as a companion thread to this video. Now, this data is interesting, but I do want to point out that there are some flaws. Many students attend multiple schools for multiple degrees, and so oftentimes the same person is representing more than one of these top programs. Additionally, this list doesn't account for all of the people that have joined and retired from orchestral playing in the last few decades. However, the statistics that we can still derive from this list are frightening. Let's take a look at what is probably the most recognizable name in classical music education. The Juilliard School is only represented by 12 of these 108 clarinetists. And while statistically that is significant, Juilliard gets to, among the hundreds of other music programs out there, claim about 11% of the clarinetists in these orchestras as alumni. At the end of the day, however, it's still only 12 clarinetists. And 12 just isn't that big of a number especially when you factor in the amount of clarinetists that graduate from Juilliard every year. It's generally a range, but after talking with some alumni of the program, it probably averages down to about three a year from all degrees. Now, before we go on, there is something everyone needs to understand. There are very few well-paying orchestral positions that open up in any given year. In most years, you could probably count the amount of positions that pay well on one hand. This is due to the fact that once an orchestral musician gets tenure in one of these well-paying orchestras, it is not uncommon for them to spend decades with that orchestra. Stanley Drucker famously spent 60 years with the New York Philharmonic. This, of course, is an extreme case. However, for the sake of this video, let's say that it wouldn't be uncommon to find musicians that graduated 30 years ago in most major symphony orchestras. This is generous, since I know for a fact that one of these musicians on this list has already been in their respective orchestra for 45 years. But let's get back to those rough Juilliard statistics. If on average, three clarinetists graduate per year, in 30 years, 90 clarinetists will have graduated from Juilliard. Of those 90, only 12 are currently representing Juilliard among these top paying orchestras. And while I'm sure you can find Juilliard graduates all over the world who have found amazing success in all facets of the music industry or other walks of life, it is still a grim reality that only 13% of them are really living that original dream that so many of them came to school for, at least in the United States. That is 13% of the students at one of the best and most noted music schools in the world. When you look at that statistic, and then at the cost of school, it's stomach turning. And then it gets worse when you realize that if you graduated with only a quarter of the total four-year cost of school is debt, $67,815, the majority of these upper-tier orchestras still wouldn't be sufficient to pay that off in 10 years. A $67,815 debt implies a roughly $746 monthly payment, or about $8,952 a year. The U.S. Department of Education recommends students not borrow more than 8% of their projected gross income or 20% of their discretionary income. Using the 8% of a projected gross income means that the recommended annual salary for someone to be able to comfortably pay off a $67,815 loan in 10 years time is about $111,900. And as a reminder, $67,815 is only a quarter of the average cost of a four-year program at one of the schools I listed earlier in this video. The overwhelming majority of the jobs on my list of the top 37 orchestras still pay nowhere near that $111,900 figure. Meaning that as college prices continue to increase and more people move through the system, there will be people who win these jobs thinking they finally made it, only to discover that they will be struggling with debt for many years to come. And now here comes the kicker. In all of this data, we've been talking about graduates of Juilliard. And if the representation rate is only 13% from Juilliard, how can other schools hope to justify their tuitions? The Peabody Institute, the place I went to for grad school, has zero alumni that I could find currently playing clarinet in any of these orchestras. How do they, or any other school offering a performance degree, begin to justify their tuition rates when there isn't a single person they can point to as a success story from their program. And for those of you who are saying, well, there are many music-based careers that students can choose to pursue once they graduate, that is absolutely true. However, each is rife with its own problems. Many people will find wonderful careers playing in one of the many US military bands, but there are a lot of reasons someone may not want to or be able to join a military band. 
Musicians looking to become professors in higher academia face the prospect of more debt to acquire the all but required DMA degree that gives them the chance to be competitive for one of these highly competitive jobs. Finally, while many people talk about setting up a private studio and freelancing as a backup way of making their living, building a studio and network of contacts for gigs that brings in enough income to live off of oftentimes takes years to set up, and that was pre-COVID. With mounting student debt and the prospect of paying that back, many recent graduates will feel hard pressed to turn that into a sustainable income fast enough to keep up with payments. Ultimately, I don't know what the solution here is, how the system could be changed to better protect students. I think it's clear that the data here raises some serious ethical and moral issues, especially when we factor in the way schools advertise to students. But if presented with this information 10 years ago when I was looking at going to music school, I find myself wondering if it would have changed my mind. Would I have pursued another field? I honestly don't know. Everyone thinks that they will be the exception, the outlier, the one that beats the odds. I was never afraid of hard work, and hard work was always presented as the biggest hurdle to success. Very few people mention the emotional, financial, and oftentimes physical toll that a career in classical music can have on you. And I'm sure I'm not alone in these feelings. So I don't know if I can offer a takeaway to anyone watching this video. I've tried to let the data speak for itself. If you're considering going into significant debt to pursue a career in the orchestral world, I hope that this video provided some clarity on a topic that many musicians don't want to talk or even think about. To all of you out there struggling, fighting tooth and nail to carve out a career in this field, I truly wish you the best of luck. And until next time, happy practicing. Oh, and one last thing. I'm just one person, and like many of you, I went to school for music performance. While I did a lot of research for this video and tried my best to cite all of my sources, a lot of this information was outside of my area of expertise. So if you feel I got some of the details of this video wrong, please let me know down in the comment section below, preferably with the source. I really want this to be a useful resource for students and other people interested in music schools. I will happily list all corrections down in the comments below as they arise. Thank you so much for watching.